welcome back everyone and thank you to uh to ari uh earl for his absolutely charming musical interlude i hope everyone had a chance to uh get up and stretch their legs a little bit while they were listening um it's uh, such a such a pleasure to have his talent available to us in second life i just love it um okay uh all right hang on here let me get uh, back up to speed and uh, welcome back to the science circle end of the year panel discussion on uh the uh on the present and future of uh virtual worlds um we have uh, a, a new panel with us now this hour um uh we have uh here sitting next to me uh stephen van hook who is a uh, kip and uh, stephen has been a, a television producer a newspaper features writer a, a columnist a radio newscaster and reporter a weekly radio talk show host a television news anchor an nbc affiliate uh, news division manager and directed a nationwide television and public radio information program in the Ukraine. And Stephen has also designed and taught uh, on ground and uh, online university classes, including MBA and uh, bachelor's degree courses in the real world. Um, and uh, 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 Stephen is going to present a, a brief slideshow here for us, a PowerPoint talk. So I think we can look forward to that. And then also we have with us, um, to kind of help us um, uh, kind of finish out our discussion. We have uh, Phil Youngblood, of course, who is uh, familiar to all of the Science Circle members. Uh, he's a founding uh, chair of the CIS slash cybersecurity department. He's a Fulbright scholar. He has um, uh, a PhD in education and also in chemistry. Um, he's, uh, in fact, uh, Phil uh, runs the, um, uh, well, I should say, uh, and uh, 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 and uh, Phil has been on the Science Circle board since 2007, uh, so uh, he's a uh, uh, one of our stalwarts, and um, uh, and you know I wanted to invite him uh, uh, to speak with us, uh, you know, j because he's been you know uh, involved with this for so long. I, I really think that uh, you know he'll bring us um, uh, a very unique perspective on the uh, on the things we're going to be talking about. Um, uh, again, I'll just remind you that uh, you should be hearing us on your music stream rather than a regular Second Life voice. And, um, and also remember that uh, the Science Circle is a grant-funded nonprofit for the development of virtual world platforms for education. And with that uh, brief introduction, um, Stephen, are you ready to... Uh, uh, to uh, present your materials? I believe I am, if my audio is coming through okay. Sounds good. Let's do it. Well, thank you so much, Matt, for that nice introduction. And of course, thank you, Chan, for all your work as always pulling this all together. And it's really, it's wonderful to be on such an esteemed panel. There are so many smart insights uh, from the others, including what we've heard so far from George and Bill. And that takes some of the pressure off of me to sound uh, overly informative and smart, especially sitting here next to Science Circle founding member, Phil Youngblood. I'm really looking forward to your part, Phil. So I'm just going to quickly jump into my subject today. And it's what's happening happening in academia and how we might do a reset of our prior experience with virtual worlds and especially from the perspective of university administrators and educators and students from around the world and of course tech companies that might help make uh, some great things happen. But uh, here's the big bug in the academic room, of course. It's hard to look too far up ahead when we don't know how far down is going to be yet. So there is a big question mark after just about everything I will be saying today. Yeah, I do like this image. If you look closely, you can see a skull in the middle of the virus. My goddaughter pointed that out to me this morning. 
uh, I will be sharing some data and resources as we go. And much of all that comes from uh, this assortment of recent articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education, Inside Higher Education, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and some other credible sources. And I'll also be sharing links to some additional resources in some of the slides. And uh, you can down a, uh, download a PDF of these slides and uh, access the active links. There's a sign there, uh, uh, right there on the side of the screen. If you click that, it'll let you download the PDFs of these slides. I will be primarily focusing on U.S. news and issues since that's where I'm at here in Southern California, but it's a pretty good bet that if it's happening here in academia, it is likely happening elsewhere, or at least they're suffering the fallout from it. Uh, it is important to define a few terms right here at the top, uh, especially as it relates to online learning and technologies. And these words get confused and conflated with one another, and it especially upsets us, uh, though, uh, who have been working in online education for, for years and even decades. Uh, online courses, when I'm talking about that, uh, these have been years in the making. They're awful, often uh, fully developed. They have readings and lectures and videos and discussions and immersive activities, and they've been carefully cultivated to serve their students. Remote courses, that's what we're talking about quite a bit in the media today. Those uh, were an emergency response to COVID. Typically, it's a live course, often broadcast for one to three hours on Zoom, often by inexperienced instructors with low-tech skills. And of course, this leads to low student satisfaction. And we're seeing it in the uh, course evaluations for these remote courses. And students are even now asking for refunds or they're filing lawsuits to cover some of their tuition uh, because of their uh, sole experience with uh, remote courses rather than going back to campus. So then we have high flex courses and those are being introduced at uh, one of my universities. Uh, it's a uh, classroom broadcasts live online for two different audiences, one in the room and the other online. And this is an expensive high-tech option. It looks good in theory, but it does require high instructor skill and very little support. And one teacher remarked that uh, he teaches well in the classroom and he teaches well online, but if you put the two of them together simultaneously, we're going to fail at everything. And of course, administrators aren't happy to hear that kind of thinking. I'm also going to be briefly sharing some of my uh, own observations and experience working as an educator and course developer for some 20 years uh, at some large public and smaller private universities. And here's some of the courses and institutions uh, where I've worked. More than half of the courses have either been fully online or a hybrid mix of online and on ground and uh, because of that, I've worked with a number of platforms and programs, some of the larger ones still around doing well, some of the smaller proprietary platforms are no longer with us. But it gives me a sense of what works, what administrators are looking for, and what students like, and those aren't necessarily all the same thing, of course. And uh, for some 15 years, I've also been experimenting uh, with educational bills and Second Life. Uh, for a couple of years, the Science Circle has let me huddle in a corner of this sim uh, while I've been setting up uh, some virtual learning demonstrations for my universities, trying to pull them in. Uh, you can get a landmark uh, to this, clicking that little eye on. on the uh, screen here, that'll give you a landmark. Uh, I'm just right over the hill here. I'm not hard to find. Um, and now it's time, let's go ahead, let's talk about what's happening in academia over the last year since the COVID crisis uh, began. Uh, it's been more of a morphing, really, than a revolution or a redesign. Uh, the transformational forces, well, these have already been at play for a long time. Uh, the lower state funding universities and colleges are suffering. The demographic dip in enrollments and administrators stressing over budget cuts and program reductions and up to 30%. Uh, I just saw this figure, up to 30% of a, a university's 
city's revenue may come from dorms and dining. And that is a really big loss uh, right now. Uh, also, uh, there is a lot of pressure to go ahead and cut more into tenure. Uh, and replace those expensive professors with adjuncts. So one dean just got in trouble in Colorado. Maybe you saw that story. Uh, he said, this is a great chance to shove out some of those tenured professors. Why waste a good pandemic, he said. Uh, and of course, he got a pretty good lashing in the media uh, over that. Uh, these are uh, forces that have been uh, simmering and expanding for decades now, and, and now the blinds on many of our social systems are being lifted, and we get a clear uh, shot of just what's behind the curtain. Uh, and Zoom, of course, now is the hub of almost all my online classes everywhere. I'm teaching currently for four different universities. All of them are using Zoom. After a couple terms, I think we're doing better on it. But, you know, historically, academia doesn't move very fast. All the uh, instructors in the room, you know what I'm talking about. And when it does move well, it doesn't always do it right the first time or even the second time. And I can't talk too much about the internal specifics, what's happening at my universities, but I can uh, at least share a few steps that they have released to the media. Uh, one of them, after uh, COVID closed the UCLA campus last spring term, they put up a virtual campus in Minecraft, and it was interesting to look at, but I don't think uh, they've done much with it. Uh, it is interesting to note this was paid for out of the Bruin Gaming Fund, uh, which I think uh, is indicative of something. And uh, National University, also where I teach, it, recently implemented an artificial intelligence program that was touched on earlier today. Uh, they, they use the uh, software company Payback. Well, there is an intriguing, threatening name. Uh, the goal of this, uh, stated in the release here, is to better engage all the online students, which right now all of them is, are, and, and, and engage them in the course discussion and the tasks, and to provide, provide students with uh, suggestions on how to do better from an artificial intelligence source. Uh, this is supposed to help uh, instructors focus more on some of our other resources, it says. And it may worry some that it's just a sor short step between augmenting instructors and actually replacing them. That may ultimately be where the artificial intelligence is going to be taking us. And then uh, we need to consider, well, what do the students want? What are they expecting from us? What do they desire? What do they need? And the best way to uh, get to the heart of this is to better understand them. Uh, and in the 20 years that I've been teaching, let's see, I started at UCSB 20 years ago in 2000. It's exactly 20 years now. Uh, the largest group of students coming through uh, have been millennials. And as an aging hippie uh, from the 70s, I've always felt a special affinity with the millennials. Maybe we have some in the, uh, the audience today. Other uh, older siblings, when I taught them, they seemed more focused on careers and earnings, while the millennials seem more focused on issues. And they have this get over it attitude towards racism and sexism and intolerance that I really uh, admire. As hippies, you know, we protested against the war and for civil rights, and the hippies got beaten because we were long haired and perhaps smelly and most likely drug users. But the millennials that we've seen protesting over the last uh, several months now, they've just been too cute to beat. They got cute shoes and they got cute backpacks and their moms were right alongside to protect them. And we really need to understand this new generation if we're going to serve uh, them well. And here's just a couple of interesting tidbits. Uh, those in the upper economic tier of millennials are about to inherit some $30 trillion from uh, the retiring and 
expiring boomers. And that'll be over the next decade, the next 10 years or so. And more and more of these millennial heirs are saying they don't want that uber wealth. They're going to be giving it away. Uh, There's more news uh, reports on this very topic, including giving away what what they inherit as real estate and art and jewels. And no doubt that is harsh news to their uh, elders that have spent lifetimes accumulating this wealth to hear their their offspring just wanting to give it away. And that also, that coincides uh, with this great bulk of millennials who are unable to find any jobs or certainly any well-paying jobs with any kind of future. And many of them have become sullen and depressed and we see high rates of drug abuse and self-harm. And now not everyone wants to go to school, but for those who do, we can certainly make learning more accessible, more inclusive, more fun, more relevant. Something to keep in mind is this is happening across the entire economic spectrum. And uh, futurologists are predicting by the year 2050 that artificial intelligence and robots may uh, well in trench this new breed of people, a useless class of people that are not just unemployed, but unemployable. There's just nothing for them to do. And an interesting point in this article is they suggest virtual reality worlds might provide them with far more excitement and emotional engagement than the real outside world. And this might work as a, as a replacement for uh, the regular life they may have been hoping for. Uh, These virtual worlds, they also provide a sense of place and belonging. This is so important uh, to student success and retention. Uh, So much of our college experience, you know that, you remember that, even if it was decades ago, uh, is not just sitting in a classroom. Well, we can do that just about as well as being online. These these students are looking to mix and mingle and experience the lifestyle and setting. They want to party and play. And the more we can connect with them in a context of place, the longer they will stay connected uh, with us. About three years ago, uh, we were talking about uh, Rosedale a little bit earlier today. About three years ago, I participated in a webinar uh, with Philip Rosedale. He was the CEO of High Fidelity at the time and founder of Linden Labs. Sansar was on the horizon. And they also uh, brought in tech evangelist Robert Scoble. And they were previewing some emerging uh, technologies, including Sansar. And uh, much of it has not seen the light of day, that's for sure. Uh, But a few things they did get right. I asked them about uh, educational uses of the the new 3D immersive technology, practical uh, excuses that they could see uh, instructors and universities adopting. And they gave an in-depth response. You can find a link to the video. It's on the uh, screen here. There's also a transcript of the session notes. There were some really interesting uh, insights shared there. Everyone, you know, students are already using uh, augmented reality and virtual reality glasses and uh, participating on these very expensive programs, learning how to build uh, uh, track caterpillar tractors and Boeing jet engines and uh, studying principles of gravity between planets and you know uh, what's capable here. But the the problem with this is the cost of these virtual design platforms, these immersive platforms are not cheap. Uh, The video for Grand Theft Auto 5 alone was $400 million. And to have effective virtual world learning expenses is also going to be costly. Um, But the costs... Uh, of simply doing what we're doing right now, simply hanging out and giving talks on a stage. Well, these are simple and inexpensive ideas. And and, uh, Scoble and Rosedale says it's events like this that are ultimately going to carry the day uh, where this physicality of place is just magical, they say. And so the question is, well, what do we do best in virtual worlds as educators? And this is it right here, right now. Look, here's a screenshot of an earlier uh, seminar here in the Science Circle Open Air Auditorium. It's this wonderful 
place we have a real sense of being, a real sense of place, there's context and proportion and exploration and tactile interactivity and even games. And we just don't give that in a Zoom class uh, where every square uh, and flat face is in your face. That's a problem with it. It's an exhausting uh, synthetic abstract. I've done hundreds of these, and it's a common complaint that these Zoom sessions are just exhausting. And I think that's part of it is it, it, it's just not real, and our brains are trying to make sense of it, whereas we have a much greater sense, I think, of place and being in these virtual worlds. So what do we need to do uh, to bring educators and academia in? Here are uh, a few of my suggestions uh, to those designing virtual worlds and technology uh, for educators. And first of all, it is really time to polish everything up. Uh, and rather than just seeking quick fixes and substitutes, academia is looking very, very hard right now uh, at uh, options. Online learning is not going to go away uh, now that we've seen the need and application of it. Many students uh, are, are uh, going to want to hang on to this. Many of them don't like uh, learning online, but more and more are starting to uh, demand it. And as academia suffers further and further cuts, they are going to be looking hard for cost effective and student pleasing options. Uh, the uh, educational platforms and, and uh, programs, well, they need to better understand the demands of academia. Uh, there are these old stodgy administrators that just don't understand the tech and just want to go back to the old days. Uh, but that's just not going to happen. Uh, and and, and the, uh, some of the other issues they have, well, there's just there's no money for it. There's no budget. Well, there is a budget. You just have to prove that it's worth the limited funds available. Uh, another one of their concerns, of course, as always, is the overhead demands on students to have to learn new skills of a new platform, the instructors to learn a new platform. And this does have a pretty high learning curve. We all know that. And then there's also just the Title IX horrors over privacy and harassment and griefers in virtual worlds and the lawsuits that might come out of that if the students are mandated or required to participate. Uh, and there's also just plain performance standards that universities need to cover for accreditation, especially some of the higher tier universities. They want to protect their re uh, reputation. Now, I've been pitching virtual world learning to administrators for the some 15 years. I've been in uh, Second Life right around uh, with most of the old timers here. We've seen uh, the ups and downs of it. Typically, what uh, reply I get from administrators, well, there's just too much development time, too much cost, too high of a learning curve for teachers and students, and just too little practical use. So we need a uh, to ease up on access. Uh, we need to make creation easier. Uh, our invited and secured guests uh, should be able to click directly to a seat, with even without a membership, with a customized avatar, even uh, full cam function, and maybe minimal function of chat. And that should be just as easy uh, as the accessibility of Skype, where a single step gets you to where you need to be. Uh, we need the creative and simple filters of TikTok for designing. We need the functionality of Zoom, where slides and video and audio files are easily shared uh, with a single click. Uh, and uh, I think we also need to continue to counter the gaming bias. Of course, Second Life is not a game in the mind of its users, but others don't always see it that way. And so what? You know, learning can be fun and gamified. Uh, I suggest you check out Duolingo. My God, daughter suggested this to me just two weeks ago. And I studied two years of Russian in college. I lived in Russia and Ukraine speaking the language, but I've learned more Russian in just a couple of weeks playing around with Duolingo than I did in all my years. So check this out if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Really good example of how gamification works. We also need to keep in mind, unfortunately, that uh, new technologies always don't do what we hope they do. Uh, students were given access to network computers, uh, but a Duke University found that uh, the test scores in reading and math were failing. 
uh, and uh, students in the one laptop per child program were actually spending more time on games and less time on actual studies. Uh, and of course, we also work, have to work harder to bridge this digital divide, especially between rich and poor countries, uh, mostly sp split between northern and southern hemispheres and also between rich and poor communities. We also need to ensure that this digital divide isn't further compounded by the content divide. We need appropriate course materials that connect and resonate across national, cultural, economic boundaries. And that's an issue very dear to me. And yes, there are funding sources out there to help it. This development is very uh, expensive. But someone is going to do it, and someone's going to do it soon. Someone's going to do it fast. Uh, here's some of the government programs that uh, are supporting educational developments. And, of course, there's also foundations and the names that we know, Gates, Jobs, uh, Sailor. And uh, the schools are also going to be shifting money from uh, classrooms and facilities to new and better online options. You can be sure of that. There will be money for it. What we need to bring is a new a big picture and not just view from our own individual perches. We need to appreciate the practicalities and realities of administrators, now, sometimes we teachers, some don't always do that well. Uh, we also need to understand the desires and needs of students. They're facing a very different world and future, future than we did. And we have to nurture the creative abilities and aspirations of educators. And we need to embrace the ultimate possibilities and immediate limitations of learning technologies. James, James Corbin, I saw him the other night on a, on a talk show, and he was saying, you know, we've tried imagining the possibilities, and it's working, and that is just an inspiring thought. And just one more last thought uh, from Wayne Gretzky as we look towards the future. Uh, let's not get distracted by where the puck is, but let's prepare for where it will be, uh, and uh, it might just all work out. Here are some references. If this is a topic uh, that, that uh, interests you, there are some additional references and resources you can uh, check out. There's the PDF file. If you click that little sign there, you get it with hopefully the active links that all work. There's a few more that uh, you can pick up on. And uh, here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to drop me a note. It has been a pleasure. Hopefully I've stuck pretty close to the 20 minute allotment and I'm gonna turn it back to Matt. Thank you so much, everybody. Woo, thank you so much. That was uh, fantastic, Stephen. Uh, man, you ran through a lot of stuff so quickly. You know, you mentioned one thing that uh, kind of caught my attention uh, with your uh, list of uh, sort of applications and tools we could use you mentioned something about sort of limited chat functionality and i just wanted to press you what's what's your concerns about uh chatting is it just the sense that it, people will end up sort of iming each other all the time and not paying attention to the classes or something like that well that's part of it too and what i'm thinking is bringing people in that have had no experience whatsoever with the platform and and making it easy for them and what i mean limited chat is uh if if it's just a matter of i don't know how to do this and i don't know how to do that and can i fly and uh, uh, uh where can i get some better clothes is that uh you know, maybe they can be brought in uh, they can have like a general chat among themselves and then uh during the presentation itself maybe moderate chat or something just to keep uh, just to keep uh, all the chatter down a little bit it's really hard to follow it you know as a presenter <laughs> it uh, is yeah and um, uh, just to kind of follow up and some comments I was making nearby chat is that um, uh, the I think that part of the fatigue that so many people complain about with these zoom classrooms or zoom meetings is is in, in fact part due to the lack of immersiveness. I just don't think Zoom is immersive. So, you know, that um, and just staring at your screen um, uh, and, or looking at the tiles of the different faces uh, is, you know, it just gets boring and tedious um, and uh, so forth. And there are also some issues with the, the interface of Zoom, I think. Uh, a lot of times, not all of the 
um, the uh, the attendance thumbnails display. You might have to pay sort of page through uh, to see who all is there because it doesn't, you know, not all of the thumbnails fit on the screen and things like that. And um, there are a lot of issues like that. And I do think that uh, one of the, um, you know, one of the benefits of virtual worlds is the immersiveness. You know, I can spend all day on Second Life and not get exhausted. But, um, you know, I, um, you know, before the lockdown, I used to meet with my uh, buddies like once a month for a happy hour. And that was fun. And then with the lockdown, we tried to continue the happy hours on Zoom, right? And uh, so that was pretty fun. But, you know, we would all sort of get sick of it after about, you know, an hour and a half. Whereas before, you know, in real life, we could go on all night. But um, uh, but it's just not the same on Zoom. And um, uh, but but I can hang out all day on Second Life and not feel, you know, quote unquote, exhausted by Second Life. And I attribute that to the immersiveness of it. So I think that is one of the I, I would just throw this out there. So that's one of the the key benefits of a uh, of virtual world um, uh, resource for teaching um, is that uh, you can, it does overcome uh, this uh, issue of just being exhausted or bored. Yeah, I think uh, I think you've nailed it right on the head, Matt. And no doubt there's going to be a lot of dissertations coming up over our experiences <laughs> in the last year. And uh, no uh, doubt. if nothing else, it's just as, a, as an educator, and I've spent many years in the classroom, what we have in the classroom is a sense of proportion. You have the students in front that are engaged and, and listening carefully, and then the students in the back that have this natural distance to them. You don't get that sense in Zoom. You very much get that sense of proportion and perspective here in Second Life. As a, as a presenter, as an educator, I think that makes all the difference. So thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, and I do, you know, I, uh, uh, as we touched on in the first hour, the issue of the avatars, you know, I remember uh, back when, um, oh, what's his name? I was holding his, um, his office hours here. Um, and he was mentioning that the Linden's were uh, highly cognizant of the challenge of um, uh, of, uh, of for newbies uh, to sort of figure Second Life out uh, and how to create an avatar. Like uh, Second Life is not just a plug and play application. Uh, once you log in and create it, you create an account and log in, and you have uh, a, a default avatar. Um, uh, that's not good enough for Second Life. You really need to be able to customize your avatar kind of like the way you do in any, like in a console game or something like that, uh, where you can, in those, you sort of select an avatar from a menu. Maybe you can select from a limited uh, library of outfits and so forth. But so there's a you know, kind of a minimum amount of customization. But Second Life really allows you to create any look or any appearance that you want. But it's not easy, especially with mesh. You know, I think mesh is, uh, has a very steep learning curve. So all of these are, this is all like a barrier to the wide adoption of a, of a platform like Second Life. Just the, the, the entry level barriers of complexity uh, make, it, uh, make it challenging. Uh, so there, apparently there's a lot of hand wringing about this uh, at Linden Labs about how to simplify all that, but I'm not sure that, not really sure that anyone has an easy answer to it though. Well, money makes everything easier, doesn't it? And maybe as the funding begins to flow, as this becomes recognized as the valuable source it will be, uh, we'll see greater investment. You know, that is an excellent point. I mean, one reason maybe it's so difficult is because uh, Second Life is still kind of a niche world and simply, the, you know, the demand simply isn't there. But uh, if the demand, like, you know, uh, so it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg problem, um, but, but uh, perhaps um, a more widespread adoption of Second Life or some other comparable platform um, would, in fact, drive and motivate the creation or, or you know, even if it's just a matter of, 
of uh, having a, a much, much bigger library of kind of default avatars that you could adopt. Even that would probably help a lot, I think. Well, I'd love to see uh, see the platform be Second Life. We've all invested a lot in it. But if it is some other platform that steps up and serves the need, I think we'll be equally uh, as happy to see that happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, well, thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, I do want to give, uh, I, I, I think uh, now I'd like to um, uh, move along to Phil. We have about half an hour left. And I think Phil may have, have uh, some remarks he might want to make, but I think uh, for the most part, I'm kind of anticipating that uh, for the rest, for this next half hour, I think we'll probably just have kind of a, a free form discussion of, uh, of any of the ideas that kind of pop into our head or concerns or whatever. But um, Phil, why don't you, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you have a, uh, a chance to, uh, you know, share your impressions of what we talked about today. Okay, sounds good. Let me check the voice first. Is everybody hearing? Sounds good. Okay. Uh, yes, I do have some things that I'd like to uh, share with you, uh, particularly in terms of context. Uh, we certainly covered a lot today, uh, from technology to sociology to art and academia, and the audience is still stuck around. Thank you. <laughs> it's a fascinating topic and a really good one for the um, end of the year. What I'm going to cover today is, can be uh, categorized in three areas. One is that we actually create the world in which we live. We all do that. And I would like to share some of the virtual worlds, past and present, uh, to put things in context. And then kind of a follow-up with some of the things that were already said about modern lessons of the uh, virtual world. So here goes. Um, so the first thing I would like to suggest is that, like Michael Crichton here, is that virtual worlds aren't new. In other words, we all are viewing this exact same presentation today, but we're seeing it through different eyes, through our different experiences, through different uh, uh, culture, cultural lenses. And that's kind of what he meant here is that we do always are living in a virtual environment that is our own world. But I'd also like to uh, suggest that uh, virtual worlds have been around since the very beginning. In other words, how do you express your ideas to another person? Um, in pre-electric technologies, you had language, which was a huge breakthrough, and also music. We just heard that during the interlude. We can all identify with that. And art. We talked about that in uh, the first um, section of these presentations. When we got to electrical technologies, what happened was the distance closed. In other words, it no longer mattered whether you were in uh, Russia or India or Europe or the Americas or Australia is that essentially uh, because of the speed of uh, electricity and speed of light uh, you could but you could only transport you could only transport uh, a part of you in other words you pick up the telephone or a radio and you've got sound much like we talked about here you've got the the, the voice and what it can and music and what it can present of us. And then what text can, uh, which is, uh, and then image and sound when we got to tele television, but that's only been fairly recent. Um, when we got to electronic technologies, which is by definition, electronic means computer chips essentially. And if you start looking at that and the way the web and virtual environments have evolved, you've got the web, which is essentially one way and primarily text. By the way, that's the very first web page back in 1989, uh, Sir uh, Tim Berners-Lee. And then you've got uh, the first interactive one, in other words, uh, with Amazon and others where you could buy stuff. In other words, it became a commercial area. And then you have uh, a, a big jump during mostly the 2000s, which is social media. And then you've got the virtual worlds, the 2D, the 3D, 2D, quasi 3, and then actually the real virtual worlds uh, where you have VR and AR. 
let's take a look then at the definitions really quickly because we've been throwing it around and as uh, one of the presenters did uh, talk about, I think Stephen, we need to talk about terms. And so virtual then has the power of acting as part of you. In other words, essence or representation. Right now you're not seeing me, but you're, you're hearing me in my voice at least, and perhaps my avatar represents me. And so avatar has been around for a very long time. Uh, essentially an email, you've got uh, you know, a, a, a username or something, and then you had an icon or a picture as in like Facebook. And then now you've got actual real 3D models, which we have talked about are very significant. In other words, we care about what we look like here in, uh, vir in um, virtual worlds, particularly the 3D ones as, as the avatar. Let's take a look at some of the virtual worlds. First of all, you, some of this may be a surprise, but um, at its heyday anyway, there were over 300 million people registered in non-gaming, non-gaming social virtual worlds. If you, there's a couple links up there. I can uh, present them a little bit later, but you can see up to 150 different virtual worlds and then open sim sites and yes, uh, side circles on there. And here's kind of a classification of the virtual worlds. And I'm going to talk a tiny bit about, uh, there's not a lot of time, but I'm going to kind of roar through uh, some of those there. But you'll notice those are divided up into basic functions and age. If you look at uh, what most virtual worlds are targeted to, you're talking about preteens. In other words, when people want to start socializing and learning to fit in, you've got those. Uh, and then Second Life, really, the, one of the, somebody asked about the average uh, age of Second Life, and actually at one time it was 37. It was the uh, oldest one, and essentially Second Life is a place for creativity. And then you've got some other ones. So let's take a look. Some of the forerunners back in the uh, main, from the early days of mainframes, I remember. In fact, actually, uh, the first um, Club Penguin, absolutely. I'm going to be talking about that in a second. So you got uh, these mainframe kind of what they called eyeball uh, games, even as early as the 70s. And then Habitat really is kind of the, the, the grandparent of them all as far as forerunners of the uh, massive uh, multiplayer online uh, role-playing games that was invented uh, by uh, Lucasfilms back in uh, the 80s. Some of the early pioneers... Uh, Yville. Now, if you've actually been in any of these, uh, let me know. So, for example, Yville was a quasi learning environment where you could have, like we said, tiny little cartoon thing. And it was created by Caltech, uh, interestingly enough. Um, Active Worlds. That was actually where I first got in, in around 1998, 1999. Um, Active Worlds looked a lot like Second Life and it's still around. Uh, there's, there's, uh, and the worlds are not confined to like. Um, 250 meters by 250 meters. One of them is larger than the UK in actual size. Then you had uh, Club Penguin. If uh, for depending on uh, uh, kids or how old you are, or whatever you might know some of these. You had Club Penguins. So these are the these are by the way the really heavyweight ones. Haba Hotel is one of the largest ever, and it's basically a little cartoony place. Same thing with Club Penguin, where you could socialize, play games. Uh, customize your uh, room or avatar. But in both of these, the chat was monitored because you're talking about kids. I mean, young kids. And uh, in some cases, like in the Club Penguin, you, from my understanding, yeah, it was. Actually, Club Penguin is a precursor to Animal Crossing. I would say uh, that's, a, that's a good uh, uh, observation. Speaking of which, um, somebody mentioned the IMVU one and that we have a lot of um, kind of IMVU uh, refugees in social life, uh, excuse me, in, in Second Life. Um, there are also ones that are geared toward money making. In other words, like um, there was one called Barbie doll, uh, let's see, Barbie dolls or Barbie world and star dolls and that's it. But look at how many. That's actually Star Dolls, 400 million teens that are, and they, they talk about uh, that seeking fame, fashion, friends, games and activity, web-based. Here are some notable others, I threw them in. One was uh, uh, China, 
had one that looked remarkably similar to Second Life. It didn't last for very long, partly because, and, and the explanation is, is that the chat could not be controlled. In other words, much like in Second Life, there is no control of the chat, which of course, uh, for all technologies, that's a plus or minus. In other words, you can have griefers or you can have the type of chat that we're, we're doing here. And then there uh, was uh, another one um, that reinvented itself like some of them uh, have, basically an online getaway to hang out with your friends, meet new ones and such. Uh, Second Life, we all know there's some uh, actual information about it that was gotten uh, through, uh, and it's was celebrating just recently its uh, 18th or 15th and or more um, anniversary. And one of the things that, that all of these have uh, are basic, yes, it actually does, although it wasn't as popular until about 2000, end of 2006 was when it really started taking off. And then 2007 in the summer was a real peak. And then into 2008, and then it started as like, somebody pointed out in the last time we had uh, one of these presentations that they go, oh, there's a slide that Phil shows. Yes, one of these hype things. Uh, we're basically in 2008 and they realized uh, businesses realize, for example, that the people in Second Life are not new people to market to. They actually are people already buying stuff. <laughs> but it's a huge, it's still a huge thing. Um, and so let's take a look at some of its competitors. Though. In other words, we all know from a business standpoint that you can't just stand still or you're going to be overtaken. One of them that somebody mentioned the other day was SignSpace. I took a look at that. They kind of got together with Unity and boy, do they look, has anyone been there? Because boy, do they look a lot like SignSpace, but they're used, I mean, like Second Life, except that they're both web-based and virtual reality. One of the things that um, Second Life has not done well is obviously go to the web. That would be the ultimate. In other words, uh, a web browser that everybody can use, but for various reasons, like George mentioned and stuff, there's some technical issues or problems with doing that. But since Second Life is so server heavy, in other words, it's resident on, without getting into too much of the technical, it's resident on the servers instead of on your client. And then there's problems with bandwidth and all that. Now, I took a look at another one that somebody mentioned the other day, and it was this 3D web worlds um, now, this is, this is talked about a walk-in VW. It is really primitive looking uh, and such like that, but it's really easy to get to it, and it's really easy to learn. Uh, and essentially, it's, they're renting out spaces for business and education. If all you're going to do is chat and do something better than Zoom, then something like this is an option. It's not as rich as what we're talking about here, interactive or anything else, but if that's all you're doing showing stuff and chatting, then that's a competitor. Same thing, of course, with some of the um, open source ones. Somebody mentioned in the chat that Second Life was expensive. Well, it is. And some of these other ones are also. So uh, anyone who actually can come up with an open source web browser accessible one is going to really clean up in the VW market. Let's take a look at now, instead of going too far off into uh, all the different possible virtual worlds, depending on how you describe them. Let's take a look at some of the ones people may have heard. Um, World of Warcraft, of course, is, is, is one of the uh, uh, ultimate big ones that done. Fortnite seems to be an interesting one, uh, particularly during the pandemic that's become real popular. You've got Minecraft, of course, which is really relatively new, but it's also the best selling video game of all time. Um, because of its capabilities to be both creative and to socialize. And then I'm just going to briefly touch on this. Some of the early, the most popular games in, in uh, video games in terms of sales, you've got some of the really early ones, you know, that, that weren't uh, social, but that were games. You know, Pac-Man, Tetris, Mario Brothers, then Pokemon, which is still the largest franchise. I mean, it's larger than... Star Wars or any of the other franchises as far as worldwide. Elder Scrolls, which is one of uh, my favorites, actually. Call of Duty is still the top uh, first-person shooter. Wii, Minecraft, and others. 
Okay, there are also social simulation games. In other words, Animal Crossing. Uh, interesting thing about Animal Crossing, I know some people in their 70s who use Animal Crossing, and it's not because of the sophistication of Animal Crossing, but because that's where the grandkids are, <laughs> or that's where other people are. And so coming back, listening to all the speakers and coming back, I see the, the, the most important things, underlying concepts, is not community is a place of the mind, and it's not just a place, but you do have to have a sense of place, as, as Stephen mentioned. But basically, they will succeed where they empower others to be creative, in other words, users to be creative, to be able to interact, and then to learn and share with each other. That's how, and then uh, how we're going to, uh, what, in other words, virtual worlds will always be around, and that's how we're going to, uh, they're going to increase. Now let's take, let me take a look at a couple more and then at some of the lessons learned, uh, kind of piggybacking a little bit on what people have said earlier. Okay, MOOCs, anyone ever taken a course from a, a massive open line course? Uh, Stanford in particular is uh, uh, one of the pioneers in this. Uh, in fact, 2012 was considered the year of the MOOC. Uh, Khan Academy, I put that down myself uh, because that's one guy's vision. It was around for a while. And actually it's very interesting, particularly for K through 12. And then edX, uh, which was developed by MIT and, and Harvard, uh, wonderful courses uh, for free, or you can even get credit on them. Um, game engines. For you guys that are really enterprising and you want to learn how to do this yourself, <laughs> is there is Unreal was one of the first ones. And then mostly uh, that was the one that developed a lot of the early first person shooters. And then Unity. Unity is pretty much, yeah, I think edX is, is, is great. And then uh, Unity is about cleaned up now in the market for actually how to create these. Um, and then they work. What, what actually happens is you have the game logistics and then you have a graphics rendering software, much like we have in here with the mesh and such. And then you have audio, which if everybody remembers, I think it was 2010, which we uh, had audio in Second Life. And then the physics engine, in other words, the, one of the things about the physics engine, here again, I'm watching my time, but one of the things about the physics engine, which is Havoc here, and by the way, Havoc was used in almost everything you can imagine from the movie The Matrix uh, on up um, and in games and such. But essentially, what we, in order to interact, we want to interact in a world, most people want to interact in a world which is familiar to them. In other words, Earth gravity, Earth, uh, gravity going down, uh, objects behaving the way we would expect, that sort of thing. But frankly, that could be a limitation. I was trying to work with the, um, let's see, was it Mars Society or whatever, trying to invent a uh, one of the, or trying to create one of these wheels in space and trying to create gravity that goes in different directions. In other words, as the wheel went around is really a difficult challenge in a place like this where the physics doesn't support it. Or to create, uh, different types of gravities being on the moon and stuff. Okay, so let's take a look then at some of the realities having to do with virtual. One is, and this may be surprising, how many gamers do you think there are? There's 3 billion, actually 2.7 uh, billion in 2020. Uh, very high growth rate, very big uh, industry, uh, but it really is all about uh, feeling like you're present with others and being able to interact, being able to create. Um, However, one of the realities is there is no, what I mean by there's no benevolent tech God is there's nobody just gonna give you all this stuff for free. These are all companies <laughs> and they have to make a profit and they do it either by advertising or they do it by subscriptions or rentals or ads, uh, all of that sort of thing. And that basically the look and speed are balanced with creation. For a game like this, which is not a game, this is not a game. But for a uh, place like this, to be creative, you can't set it up on your laptop unless you've got a really good laptop. Or So in other words, uh, the more creativity and freedom of expression, all that, the more technology you need. And if it's based somewhere else on a big computer called a server uh, and you have to then download it to you, 
you're going to need high bandwidth, high technology, and that's not accessible for everybody. So there is a balance here between technology. Uh, 5G may cure that uh, because it's very high bandwidth. But, um, oh, by the way, hey, uh, with Syzygy, one thing he's uh, saying that I want to touch on real quick is how many people have actually used physical objects? In other words, almost everything in here is a static object. In other words, if you drop it, like, like the uh, uh, slide viewer right there, if that were a real object, it would drop to the ground and crash. How many people have actually tried physical objects in there? I'm very surprised that we haven't used those a lot. I'm going to be experimenting a little bit this next year because uh, physical objects are very uh, interesting and they're available in Second Life. And you can, you, there's a lot of flexibility with them and you can see how things actually interact uh, physically. Okay, here was a prediction back in 2008. Is that 80% of active internet users in Fortune 500 companies will have a virtual presence in 2011. Why did that not happen? That was one of the main themes today. Yeah, bouncy. <laughs> well, if you set it up as bouncy, if you set it up, in other words, uh, the physical thing, you could set it up as to what this. Uh, here are some suggestions, and I'd love to hear some in chat, is how come we're not all using 3D virtual worlds? How come all the businesses aren't? Uh, one is uh, negative perceptions. One is some people got it into the head that for some reason a game is childish. Uh, not true, but that's kind of, in other words, it's, if it's not real, then it has no real importance. Or it's a deviant platform. In other words, I was really surprised that people thought that Second Life was any different. In other words, why were they surprised that Second Life was any different than First Life? <laughs> because you, you have First Life real humans here, and they will do whatever they want to do in Second Life. And in some cases, people will do it more because of the anonymity and the whole bit like that. So I was really surprised with the... Uh, uh, kind of reaction to that. Or it's difficult, we've touched on this, uh, learning curves, that sort of thing. Or uh, do I really want to learn this? Is it uh, because it's not going to be around? Um, yeah, and I'd love to, unfortunately with the time, I'd love to, like Shiloh, you've got some good stuff in there. And we're just going to, I'm going to pop through a few of these things and then we're going to be slightly, slightly close to out of time here. But the common, of course, positive ones are exactly what you guys have been talking about. Social, creative, collaborative. I didn't make up the slide just a minute ago. Global communications. That's one of my biggies in, in Second Life. If we were to look at the audience right now, we would have a slice of the world and a level playing field. People also mention that. In other words, if you can access it, does it matter who is sitting up here or who's in the audience? We all have basically an equal voice in chat, an equal voice. In, in creating, in experiencing stuff like that, which there are enormous barriers in our first life, but in here, there are almost no barriers, aside from language. Uh, but even then there's, uh, and again, this is all in your head. In other words, whether you feel in here and whether you feel that the, the avatar sitting next to you is actually another human, also dictates whether you're a griefer or not. In other words, if this is a game and the person the avatar sitting next to you is not a real human. It's easy to be a griefer. But if you actually know that that person sitting next to you is a real person somewhere else that's doing the same as you now, that's how these worlds will succeed. So finally, here are a few quotes that basically said we wanted to have this for world forever. Uh, William Shakespeare, you know, Brave New World, it has such people in it. Whole worlds where our friends are. Uh, Henry David Thoreau, Exploring Strange New Worlds where no one's gone before, Gene Rosemary. And so I believe that uh, we're going to be spending a lot more time in virtual realities, what, whatever they are, whether they're web-based, whether they're based like here, whether they're, in other words, the, the past the technological barriers. This is going to be, this is a, Brave new world, we're really at the very beginning of it. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, Side Circle is one of the bleeding edge applications, and this is going to be uh, a marvelous place, and you guys are all pioneers, and I'm really glad that uh, 
we're we're all in this together, and that we're experiencing, and we're we're going to be the ones that are um, guiding our way into the future. And so I'd like to leave on that positive note uh, mm -hmm. at a year that's not so positive, and I'll turn it over to Darren. Yes, fantastic. You know, uh, this was very exciting presentation, Phil. I, I got to say, I feel quite exhilarated at sort of feeling like we are all pioneers. I mean, uh, you know, I think pretty much everyone here has been in Second Life a long time, and we're all veterans. We kind of got in at the beginning, more or less, and and um, uh, and the fact that we can have this conversation now in 2020 um, and really begin to see, um, uh, you know, there's, there, I don't know, there's sort of a glimmer of hope that, you know, what we, what we want to see happen um, from this technology, uh, you know, suddenly seems possible. Um, it's very exciting, I think, and uh, I feel like your sort of historical survey of uh, uh, all of these platforms that have come before us uh, just has just feels very exhilarating. It's fantastic. Any questions from the audience? Since this is the last presentation, any anything about anything we've talked about today? I'm just trying to scroll up through the nearby chat here to see if we want to. Um, Syzygy mentions, yes, connection. We do feel connected here. Um, and I, I agree with that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> um, while you're looking for some of them, by the way, uh, there are some of the technologies like the Unreal Game Engine and some of the ones, if, if anybody remembers back 2008, 2007, almost all the businesses were actually in here. And what they found was kind of what we found in some cases, you know, there may be griefers that have to go private, even if they were private, it was really private. IBM used to have a really big uh, presence in here and uh, same thing with a lot of other businesses. And what they did was they essentially took their own programmers or technology and then are still using this type of technology. It's just that uh, they've, they've made it more proprietary so people um, can't get in there because they have to talk real business. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Um, yes, you know, my, uh, my initial curiosity at Second Life was raised by reading about it in uh, business journals. Um, and uh, and most of the big universities, as Charlotte points out, yes, we're here. Yeah, and it was being touted as a way for outfits like Nike or, I guess, even IBM and uh, other sort of retailers. I think maybe I don't. I, I want to say Walmart, but I'm not sure if that's the case. But you get well, the idea. I, but you totally get the idea that they that they yeah. could have that they could have virtual stores in Second Life through which you could buy physical objects, kind of like Amazon, except you would walk into a, a virtual store instead of just scrolling a website. I think that was kind of the, the idea that people had. Um, but, you know, but, we, but when I first logged in, like in 2008, and I would go visit uh, these uh, business shops or business regions, they were empty. And there wasn't really, in fact, there wasn't really anything you could buy. <laughs> so... <laughs> It didn't, it, I felt like, like even those businesses who wanted to sort of leverage this platform didn't understand how it worked. They didn't know how to exploit it. No, and I really do think that some of the businesses thought that they had a brand new audience, you know, millions of people and didn't, I mean, maybe that's simplistic, but uh, did they really think that the avatars were new customers or actually customers that have already bought stuff? So. It was simply another way of reaching them like the web. And that, yeah. that's kind of where I think some of it went wrong. Yeah. And I don't know if it was a coincidence, but a lot of those uh, for-profit businesses left Second Life around the same time that the academic and nonprofit, you know, NPR and the other universities all seemed to leave Second Life too. Now, 
those academic and nonprofits left because Linden Labs canceled the discount. Uh, so it may have been that the, the that the for profit businesses that might have just been a coincidence. I don't know. Um, um, I see George. Do you have a comment? I see you've got your um, yeah. mic possibly open. Plus, you have a lot of good background on this stuff. I think it was a coincidence, but also the shared thing is that they exhausted the capabilities of Second Life at the time, right? Um, and there are, you know, all the usual things about griefers and, and what have you and the company's inability to improve their products and all that stuff. But there just wasn't much else to do. And then it, it was too early, right? A uh, vast majority of people couldn't take it seriously. Oh, it's just a silly game. People look like animals, etc., and all that. Um, now it's different, but it will require much more functionality, and it also needs to be taken seriously. Right now, all of these virtual environments are dominated by games companies, and they have huge resources to develop good graphics and everything, but they have zero interest, less than zero interest, to make them interoperable, right? So games are not the path towards the metaverse or 3D web. It will have to be something that grows on top of the existing internet, you know, next generation web download compatible, but also to be open source. This is the only reason why web took off because everybody can program in it. Everybody could host a server or a website. And so until that happens, you know, it'll be all kind of niche entertainment in, in some sense. I do think that, yeah, that's an interesting point, George. And I do think that uh, gamers who come into Second Life um, are a little bit befuddled by it because, in fact, there is nothing to do in Second Life. There are there are no quests. There's no leveling up. There's nothing to do, um, oh. and that I think um, uh, it, it's a. Uh, it, it, I think some people are, are challenged by that. It it does. It kind of takes a commitment to Second Life to sort of figure out what you're going to do with it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's an important point. Even back in you know, 2008, 2010, I would tell people, you should have at least two different things you wanted to do in world to, to have a sufficient motivation to go through a steep learning curve, a horrible interface, which neither of which has been improved. And, uh, and, and you're right. Um, but also, I th well, I know that all of the major virtual worlds companies, including Linden Labs, Kiteli, and ScienceBase, they're all desperate to attract business interest to use this as a conferencing uh, space, you know, shared workspace and so on. And they all have same well, same problems. Um, a friend of mine who is really familiar with the industry and all that saw the web page that Linden Lab has about, hey, your second life is your business when you uh, conferencing is on. And he said, well, look, they can't have it with, with these glossy new mesh avatars. It looks like a porn game. And businesses are not going to do that. Uh, same thing is going to apply with education and, and so on. So that's why I keep saying you really need to have high quality, realistic, functional avatars. Um, and that has many you know, difficulties involved, as we discussed. Yeah, it's all very true. I, I, I completely agree. Well, I've often, I've often wondered who does the marketing for the homepage for Linden Lab, because it's obviously not oriented toward the age group that uh, is in Second Life. And it's not oriented toward education. It's not oriented toward business. It's <laughs> so I'm wondering if there's a disconnect somewhere out there. Boy, if I could jump in a moment on that one, uh, Phil, uh, uh, and it's what I've been hearing uh, be, been said here. Where did business go? Where did academia go? Why aren't they jumping in? Why don't they get it? And really, uh, I think it's a matter of perspectives. Uh, do they really understand what the virtual world experience is about? I think they do. I mean, I've, I've been working with some pretty high placed people bringing technology into education, but I think there's a difference in perspectives, the difference in our perspectives, those of us that have been here 
for 15 years. We do get it. We see it. We love the immersive uh, uh, aspects of it, the possible of 3D, but they're looking at it from a very different perspective. When I talk to the administrators and the decision makers, uh, I, I, we may see uh, the virtual world as this wonderful place that just happens to serve academics and business, whereas they're seeing it more as an ap academic tool that just happens to be in a virtual world. They don't have that same commitment. They're, they're not looking for a second life. They barely have enough time for the first. I think what they're really looking for is this immersive, explorative experience, but they want it to be accessible and easy and one click. And that's the disconnect. I think it's just a matter of the realities of it and also just just the different perspectives on how we're approaching this. You know, one thing I do when I meet uh, newbies in Second Life, and they don't know what to do. Like they end up going to clubs. Uh, they're they're trying to find ways to make money in Second Life so they can buy stuff and blah blah blah. They don't really know what to do with themselves. And one of the things I tell them is like, think about what you're interested in. What do you like? Are you a fan of Star Wars? Um, like, are you part of a fandom or are you into art? Are you into music? Are you into science? Because when I tell them what I do in Second Life, I say, well, like on the weekends, I do all these science groups and, um, you know, we have discussion groups and stuff like that. And they say, wow, I didn't or, actually I even have this discussion with people who have been here for a long time. And they say, I I had no idea that that sort of stuff was even in Second Life. Um, but I tell them to use the search function. Just say, just search for things you're interested in. Search Star Wars or search uh, Firefly or, uh, or I don't know, whatever. And just look for communities of interest in Second Life so you can meet people with similar interests. And I think very, actually, I think very few people end up doing that. But that was kind of one of the keys for me to being able to connect in Second Life was finding communities of interest. One, let me, real quick story, is that when I first got in Second Life, I talked about in 2007 time period, I started wandering around seeing what all the different areas were. And one of the places I found was, uh, you know, one of these resident areas where you could buy a, a house and have a garden stuff. And I walked up to one of the per people in the garden and I started talking with them. And what it turned out was that this was the wife of somebody who was over in Iraq. And the only time that they could get together to feel like they were together was to basically go into their house there and be like they did. And that really struck me powerfully uh, that a place like this could really connect people when they need it. Uh, and I think that's also taking place uh, a lot in Second Life. Um, and one of the reasons why I think we're going to continue to have uh, places like this, even if it may not be here or, or whatever, but really that, that connection to other people. And I think we just, uh, yeah, <laughs> got bumped off here. Well, thank you all. Um, this was fun. And I think I also have to go. So take care, everybody. Great job, Matt. Thanks. Thanks to everybody.